baseball seasons 1969. Amazing. Go crazy, folks! Go crazy! If baseball was a game created for miracles, there may never have been a bigger one than the miracle of 1969. In the midst of a year of upheaval in America came a season of wonder on the diamond, thanks to a franchise that abandoned futility in favor of the amazing. This year, they'll be known in all the periodicals because they are the amazing, amazing bits. While there was transformation in store for the great game in the spring of 1969, there was also unrest in the great society. The United States was at a crossroads with the ongoing conflict in Vietnam, a divisive issue on the home front. And ball players were not immune to the realities of war. 1969, they still had the Vietnam War that was going on. Some of us were still active members of the Marine Corps Reserves. So whenever we saw something that was taking place in Vietnam, we didn't know if our unit was going to be recalled to active duty. I had my draft papers in my hand. And I talked to the twins about becoming a reservist with the hopes of not going to Vietnam. During the seasons, I would go on active duty for two weeks and then to come back and try to get myself back into baseball playing shape. Though even back in the clubhouse, no player could ignore the conflict's impact. A lot of things were going on in our individual minds, but whenever we went to the ballpark, you know, it was more than just an escape. It was a way for us to kind of bond. As the U.S. struggled with war, broad social change was also occurring stateside. And it was only a matter of time before the counterculture lifestyle invaded the ballpark. You guys were growing mustaches and chops. I grew an afro. I mean, there was a lot of things going on outside of the game and also in baseball. The game itself had long been resistant to tweaking, but the dominant pitching of 1968 led to criticism. The action was too one-sided. Bob Gibson made the game look silly with what he had with the ERA that you had to use a microscope in order to see it. Bob Gibson's 1.12 ERA led a pack of seven pitchers with a sub 2.0 ERA in 68, making it the lowest scoring season since 1908. Myself, I love one to nothing ball games or two to one games, but baseball fell triples, doubles, and a couple home runs would make the game a little more exciting. Going, going, going. And so, finally, the game took action. The whole thing evolved from uh, surveys that were taken by the owners to find out what it would take to draw more fans to the ballpark. The strike zone was tightened up maybe just a little bit. They dropped the mound six inches. They felt that by lowering the mound, it would give the hitter more of a chance. Pitching was further weakened by the sport's second big expansion of the decade. The talent became a little diluted, and when you expand, you get a lot of AAA pitchers who get a chance to pitch in the major league. The greatest of opportunities will be afforded to players made available by expansion who have been running second fiddle to the star players in the league. Two teams were joining the American League, the Seattle Pilots and the Kansas City Royals. I thought the people of Kansas City in this great metropolitan area should have a major league baseball team and the National League was welcoming the San Diego Padres and the first ever Canadian big league club, the Montreal Expos. I think that the people of Montreal and Canada are going to be with us, which is fantastic. The expansion led to more groundbreaking changes, splitting the leagues into two divisions of six teams each and creating a new round of playoffs before the World Series. Baseball in Canada may have been strange, and so too was all four expansion teams winning their inaugural games. The Montreal Expos get a cheer from their fans. While 
by mid-April, a long-suffering club was off to the best start in baseball. first day of the season, of course, Willie Smith hit the home run, and it started up row in Chicago. Hey, hey, holy mackerel, no doubt about it, the Cubs are on their way. Hey, 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 the Cubs are gonna pitch today, they're gonna hit today, they're gonna field today. The Cubs are gonna go all the way. I think they're gonna go all the way. I felt very strongly with the ball club we had, the pitching, the defense, that this was going to be our year. Led by Ron Santo, Billy Williams, and manager Leo DeRocher, the Cubs won their first nine games in 69, grabbing an early lead in the new NL East. And in 69, a new winning tradition emerged at Wrigley Field, Santo clicking his heels after every home victory. I was clicking my heels after wins. The fans would wait, and I'd run down and click my heels three times, and uh, they loved it. The Cubs, baseball's best team? There would be plenty more of the unexpected in 69. In 1969, the United States was a nation in turmoil. But if Americans sought a diversion from the growing social unrest, there was one place they could turn. A place that had long been a safe haven in the national consciousness. They could turn to baseball. Baseball has always been a stabilizing influence on the country. It's an escape from reality, if you will. So a lot of different things were going on, but whenever we went to the ballpark, it was checking reality at the gate, regardless of what's happening around the world. And perhaps the best place to find that escape in the summer of 69 was Baltimore, where the Orioles were dominating the American League. The Birds had a veteran roster with no visible weaknesses, as well as a manager, Earl Weaver, injecting a newfound intensity into the clubhouse in his first full season with the team. He instilled in us that we were the best. When we went out on the field, we should be the best. We went out there and took the attitude that let's go out there and show the world that we are the best. That 69 team, that was the best team that I ever played on. The familiar side here in Baltimore, Brooke Robinson coming up with a ground ball. We just kind of blew everyone away, and uh, we had a you know an outstanding club. And the Orioles lead three to nothing. It was just quite a show. I mean, we had a complete team, and we could beat you in a lot of ways. Double play. Nobody would watch you take that in practice. You just go right on down the line. There was nobody to pitch to. Robinson slams it into deep left center. Frank and myself, Buford, Blair, and Brooks, we had all the answers to all the questions. Which could just as easily have been said about the team's pitching. Talking about pitching, do you have your set rotation? Yeah, we've got McNally going the first game, Palmer the second, uh, Cuellar the third. They were a staff with not only talent, but a willingness to embrace Weaver's directive to trust the defense behind them. These people wanted the ball put in play. We had great defense, Brooks Robinson and Mark Belanger, and they wanted some ground balls hit to the left side of the infield. Dave McNally, Mike Quayle, Jim Palmer, they were just artists. And what pitching and how enjoyable it was for me just to sit there and watch them do their job. A job requirement of pitching in Baltimore was staying in the game until Weaver said so. Second opinions were unwelcome. Earl did not care about pitch counts. First time I ever kept a chart from Mike Quayle, I said, Mr. Weaver, that's his 135th pitch. He said, son, get your rear end the other end of the dugout. I'll let you know when he's tired. The pitcher is Mike Cuellar. He was the winningest left-hander in the major leagues this year with 23 victories. Cuellar and McNally, they had won 20, and Palmer was the best pitcher on the team. Palmer's really rough. He's won 14, lost three. And he's the only one that hadn't won 20. While Palmer could boast the rotation's lowest ERA, McNally started the season 15-0, and Cuellar was on his way to a Cy Young. Baltimore has been victorious by a score of 4-1. Nonetheless, the more the Orioles won, the more fiery their skipper became. Earl Weaver's team in the Eastern Division of the American League is leading everybody.
everybody else by 11 games. If we won 15 games in a row and lost the 16th, we better win the 17th. That's just the way he was, and that's the way he made us feel. He made us feel that we were the pride of the American League, and we're supposed to go out there and play like it and demonstrate that every single day we walked out there on the field. Out west in 69, the league's two expansion teams, the Pilots and the Royals, made the new AL West by far the weakest of baseball's four divisions. And by midseason, it was clear the race for the West title would come down to two clubs, the Twins and the Athletics. The A's had a great young group of players. A group that included 25-year-old third baseman Sal Bando, 27-year-old shortstop Bert Cavaneris, and a 23-year-old slugging outfielder out of Arizona State named Reggie Jackson, who got off to a huge power start after a few tips from a coach who certainly knew his way around the batter's box. In spring training, uh, Joe DiMaggio and I did work on several things, especially my hitting. And after Jackson hit 14 homers in June, he found himself on a record pace and was leading the majors by the end of the month. Led by Jackson, the upstart A's found themselves leading the West by a game on July 1st. We were a younger group of guys. We've never really been in that kind of a situation as far as a pennant race. Probably didn't know how to handle it like Minnesota did. One of the best teams I ever played on was that 69 Twins team. A team that led the AL in hits and runs and average. And with Harmon Killebrew, Tony Oliva, and eventual batting champion Rod Carew, the Twins felt they could beat anyone. Our ball club matched up very well with the Orioles, even the pitching staff, and we had a great pitching staff too. That staff starred bullpen force Ron Paranoski, the league leader in saves, as well as twin 20-game winners Dave Boswell and Jim Perry. And then there was the team's rookie manager, Billy Martin. Billy took us from just a base-to-base -base ball club and had us play the game more aggressively. Batting champ Ron Carew ties a major league record. He stole home seven times during the season. We're not just going to wait for the long run. We were going to keep coming at you every chance we got during the course of the ball game. The man that orchestrated that was Billy Martin. With baseball's new structure in 1969, no division was more competitive than the NL West. Filled with a deep roster of Hall of Fame talent, there were the Braves led by Hank Aaron, still hammering at age 35. Line drive, way back, left field, it's got a chance, it's as well as Rico Cardi and new arrival Orlando Cepeda, the baby bull, who immediately paid dividends with 22 homers and 88 RBIs. They had traded Joe Torre for Orlando Cepeda, so Cepeda came in. Cepeda had a good season, big season. In San Francisco, while Willie Mays was still the face of the Giants, nothing could stop his longtime sidekick, Willie McCovey, on pace for a career year. We had uh, great Willie McCovey over at first base, the most feared hitter I saw while I was playing Major League Baseball. What a ferocious, immense, powerful hitter Willie McCovey was. I don't think I ever caught behind any hitter who resonated the strength that McCovey did. Vaughn Osteen got a ball up and into McCovey, and he hit it out, and the Giants have passed the Dodgers. The Giants were bolstered by a player some were calling the next Willie Mays. Bobby Bonds had the rare combination of power and speed. He ran with abandon, and he had power, so what's not to like? Manager Clyde King also boasted two pitching stars bound for Cooperstown, Gaylord Perry and Juan Marichal, whose 40 combined wins made them as potent as any one-two combo in the game. Koufax and Drysdale had that distinction in the early 60s, but in the late 60s, it was Marichal and Gaylord Perry. Two balls, two strikes, on the way, and strike three called. Gaylord was a hard luck loser. He was always facing the other guy's ace because they didn't want to throw their ace against Marichal. The Dominican Dandy had made them pay over and over again in the 60s, winning more games than anyone else in a decade. Anytime that you face a guy like Juan Marichal, it's like taking a lunch down in the coal mines. 
as Hyde was, working hard. He was truly a great pitcher. Also in the West Hunt were the Cincinnati Reds, a young club with every one of its starters under the age of 29, including Tony Perez, Johnny Bench, Lee May, and defending batting champion Pete Rose. Street smart, brash, aggressive. He played the game 110%. He was contagious. Meanwhile, in the NL East, following their fast April start, the Cubs maintained a comfortable lead as spring turned to summer. The Cubs had a great ball club, and they were one of our rivals. A familiar sight to Chicago fans, Ernie Bank hitting a home run. They have an all-star infield. Ground ball in the hole. Picked off by Sano, and he's got it. Billy Williams in the outfield. Billy Williams running hard for it. There's the catch. Plus, he had a great pitching staff. Swing and a miss. So if you look at players position by position on paper, they were the better team. But you don't look at things that way. You play the game. And there was something else brewing in the NL East in 69, back at Shea Stadium in New York, where the longtime laughing stock Mets were playing a much improved brand of baseball. When they were starting to, to play better, you can't think, well, now they're going to win the pennant. Why would you ever think that? We were just kind of playing so-so ball there through the middle of the season. And then we went on a West Coast road trip. We came off of that road trip, and I think that's when, in all of us, especially the younger guys, believe that, hey, we are good enough to beat the best. It was a sudden turnaround for the franchise. The Mets had begun play in 1962 as the National League club to replace the relocated Giants and Dodgers, and they'd struggled mightily from the outset. The fans were in mourning that they'd lost the Dodgers and the Giants. So when the National League came back to New York, that right away brought a lot of fans to the ballpark. Fans who embraced the new team despite its pitiful play, no doubt due in part to the colorful charisma of the club's manager, Casey Stengel. As soon as the kid can talk, he starts to say, Metsy, Metsy, not Papa, not Mama, Metsy, Metsy, Metsy. But even Stengel ease couldn't mask the fact that the Mets averaged 109 losses over their first five seasons. Those years prior to 69, the fans felt sorry for the players. And certainly, uh, I think the players were embarrassed playing in front of the fans. But the, the fans stuck with us. And a ray of light came in 1966 when the Mets won a lottery to earn the signing rights to pitching phenom Tom Seaver. Soon, Seaver and young lefty Jerry Kuzman were in Queens flashing their potential. Seaver and Kuzman gave the Mets something special. They may have had some hope based on what Seaver and Kuzman had become already. You have to consider that the beginning of the 69 team. And as the Mets showed market improvement, another piece of their puzzle was a New York legend, former Brooklyn Dodger Gil Hodges, named the team's manager in 1968. What changed our club in 69 was Gil Hodges. He was a presence with that ball club that was exactly what we needed. The reason for the uh, New York Mets' uh, success in uh, 1969 uh, certainly has been a great team effort, I think. Gil had the right way, and uh, because it was the right way, we were so much more successful, which made 1969 the amazing year. At the 1969 All-Star Game in Washington, D.C., power hitters took center stage. The leagues combined to slug five home runs, two of them off the bat of Willie McCovey in a 9-3 National League victory. It was a stark contrast to the 1-0 1968 Midsummer Classic, shining a light on the offensive boost that rules changes and expansion had given the game. I had a pretty good year. I don't know. Maybe it was because the mound was lower. I think a lot of pitchers lost a little velocity, a little more break on their curveball. Making that adjustment was very difficult for pitchers. Collectively, Major League pitchers saw their ERAs jump from 2.98 in 1968 to 3.61 in 69 and baseball's hitters reaped the benefits. Home run totals and batting averages were up all over the game. And perhaps the most dramatic hitting story of the first half was in Oakland, 
where through July, the future Mr. October, Reggie Jackson, was matching the pace Roger Maris had magically set just eight years earlier. When he started to hit home runs in uh, 69, had 37 by the All-Star break, the attention was enormous. Obviously, there were whispers, and then those whispers became a little bit louder. Here's a guy that might break the record. Even in the face of the offensive explosion, around the game, there was an arsenal of arms keeping the spirit of 68 alive on the mound. Great pitching could still be found plenty of places. Like in Baltimore, where the Orioles had the American League's lowest ERA. Pitching, if you had the right pitchers, dominated the game then. Often, no one was more dominant than 23-year-old Oriole righty Jim Palmer, whose season highlights included a wild no-hitter against Oakland in mid-August. You look at the final numbers, I think I struck out 11 and walked 9. The box score was kind of ugly, but it was a no-hitter, and um, it did count. <laughs> Palmer's no-no was one of six in baseball in 1969. The other five all came courtesy of National League hurlers including two youngsters, Pirates 21-year-old spot starter Bob Moose and 23-year-old Cubs southpaw Ken Holtzman, who blanked the Braves at Wrigley Field. Ground ball, it up with it, the As the Cubs held first place through the summer, America was bracing for history. Just a few years earlier, few things had appeared less likely to Americans than a lunar landing. Even if former Giants manager Alvin Dark had figured on it, coming sooner than another kind of blast, off the bat of star pitcher, but hapless hitter, Gaylord Perry. In bad practice, I could hit home runs. He said, Alvin, this here Perry kid's gonna hit some home runs for you. He turned around at six to four and said, there'll be a man on the moon before he hits a home run. Just before the All-Star break, Baseball paused in awe, along with the rest of the world, to look to the heavens. On July 20th, Apollo 11 landed on the moon. And as Sudeikis walked to first base, the astronauts have landed on the moon. We stopped a baseball game, and, and uh, we heard the broadcast when the guy was walking on the moon. As one small step for man, we had played in Montreal and a three game series and we took the bus to the airport and there was a black and white TV set in the bar and we watched the moon landing, the whole team, and that was uh, quite something. A great moment in our world history. And now that his old manager's prediction had come true, back at Candlestick Park, Gaylord Perry wasted no more time. Day the man landed on the moon. I was on the mound pitching against the Dodgers. We had a moment of silence. The next inning hit my first home run. Both team delivers now to play a long fly ball to left center field. Way back. This one is well hit going and gone. Gaylord Perry takes him up with a long home run to left center field. A perhaps more historic performance by a Hall of Fame pitcher came several weeks later when Steve Carlton set a new record for strikeouts in a game even if he picked the wrong team to do it against. That night, Carlton struck out 19, and the Mets won because Swoboda hit two two-run homers. And every so often, they would win a game that you're not supposed to win. Man had walked on the moon. Now the miracle Mets were going to attempt the baseball equivalent. on the Baltimore Orioles, thanks in large part to Frank Robinson, the team's leader in the clubhouse, and on the field. Frank Robinson, the 308 for the year, 32 homers, 100 RBI. He get right up on top of the plate and bail and rake. There's a high drive. He played hard, and he made us play hard every single game. Right field, Frank Robinson's got to get a long run to the foul line. Great play by Robinson. Frank just made us that much better than everyone else. Let's take a look again at the swing of Frank Robinson that puts Baltimore on the board. 
And then there was the second half of Baltimore's powerful one-two punch. I used to kid Frank all the time. Aren't you glad you got somebody like me hitting right behind you? Boog Powell hit 37 homers and had a career best 121 RBIs in 1969 as the Orioles cruised to a division title. Then on September the 13th, the Baltimore Orioles clinched the championship in the American League East. In the AL West, Reggie Jackson had been on an historic home run pace in the first half. But the slugger only managed 10 more homers in the second. And as Jackson faded, the A's fell further behind the Twins. We knew that we were going to break away from them because we thought we were a lot more powerful than their ball club was. Drew leads the American League in batting, lines his ball to left. At the top of the Twins lineup, second baseman Rod Carew was on his way to a batting title. And while he and Tony Oliva played big roles for Minnesota, there was no question who was at the team's heart. Armand Killebrew stepping into that. If we were down and we needed a run, a big blast, we knew Harmon was going to come through. Probably the prime candidate for most valuable player of the year honors in the American League. He hit some of the most massive home runs that you ever saw. Bang, bang. He was on it. Harmon Killebrew won the 1969 American League MVP award. And under rookie manager Billy Martin, the Twins outhammered and outlasted the A's, winning the West by nine games. We just had a great lineup, and uh, all through the lineup, guys that could hit the ball out of the ballpark and hit for average. The NL West race, meanwhile, would last all season long. And a lot going on in this National League West. With four teams and a bevy of all-stars battling for the division title. The Western Division was a very, very tough uh, division to play in. We had the Dodgers, the Giants, the Atlanta Braves, the Cincinnati Reds. You had no idea who was going to win this thing. Every day there was a different team in first place in the West. Now the Giants take the field here at Kansas City. As the September stretch run began, the Giants were in first place, up just half a game on the Reds and the Dodgers, while just two games back in fourth, were the Atlanta Braves. The Western Division of the National League is still very much up in the air, so it is still a mess, and it's going to be a wild one right down to the wire for sure. The Giants were aiming to end the streak of four straight second-place finishes, and in the season's final weeks, San Francisco was fueled by the incomparable Willie Mays, chasing history as he looked to become just the second player in big league history to club 600 home runs in a career. I probably could have hit more home runs if I had tried, but winning was important to me. I felt that if a home run is good and I had won a game, that was fine. But in 69, there was an even bigger bat in the Giants' attack. This one is good. Uh, McCovey just hit. That was just a line drive that never came down. McCovey had a career year, winning the MVP award. And by late September, it looked like the first baseman and his team were turning for home. With the NL West crown in hand, the fading Dodgers were in the midst of an eight-game losing streak. And soon the Reds had fallen off the pace as well, meaning with a week to go in the season, the four-team race was down to two. But as San Francisco tried desperately to hold on for the division title, the Braves heated up. You got the ingredients there. You got Orlando Cepeda at first base, Rico Cardi in left field. He was a classic hitter. Henry Aaron hitting 44 home runs. Uh, two run homer to center field by Hank Aaron. What more do you need but a good pitcher? And in 69, the formidable anchor of the Atlanta pitching staff was knuckleballer Phil Negro. Negro really had a big year, and he could pitch every day if you wanted him to. Down the stretch, the Braves came close, starting Negro three times in seven games. He won all three and Atlanta overtook San Fran with 10 straight wins. The Atlanta Braves generate a thrilling stretch drive to win the National League West title. The debut of divisional play had produced a thrilling race that had kept four teams alive nearly the entire season. And when it was over, the Atlanta Braves were going to the playoffs. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The summer of 69. It was a season of history, from the landing on the moon, to performances at the ballpark, to a gathering of musical stars in a tiny town in upstate New York. 
as the party raged at Woodstock in mid-August. 100 miles south in the big city, the Mets were nine games behind the Cubs, but surging forward. Think big, think positive. Everything began to fall into place. You don't know you can do something until you do it, and you can gain a little confidence. Toward the middle, wipes the house, and now the first, that's two. I think that's when we really started to say, hey, we could do this, we could win this. By September 8th, Chicago's lead had been cut to two and a half games, and the Cubs were at Shea, primed for a confrontation. Now the first, look out. Santo cleanup hitter was the first guy up the next time and I wasn't gonna let the Cubs embarrass my hitters like that and so uh, I accidentally hit Santo. The game was tied at two in the sixth but in that inning came an ominous sign befitting of Chicago's cursed history. Ron Sandals in the on-deck circle, the cat walked right behind him, stopped right in front of our dugout, and just kind of peered in. Most people think that was our jinx. Who's that crossing in front of their dugout? It's not Lady Luck. The Mets just had the hex on us, no matter what. And in 69, that's what happened. The Cubs would lose two straight at Shea. And then, the next night, the Mets put their decade of futility even further behind them. went from 10 or 12 games behind to 10 games in front. And as they won 18 of their final 23 games, a miracle appeared to be in the making. And the date, September 24th, and they're facing the St. Louis Cardinals. When they finally did get there, the place went absolutely mad. I don't know that we've ever had another one now that, that was as real as that. That one was spontaneous. We celebrated very hard the night we clinched the pennant. We drank most of the champagne, not like most of the celebrations where you spray it around the clubhouse. We were just celebrating a victory. When the champagne bottles had all been emptied, it was time to focus on the Atlanta Braves and the NL Championship Series. In that playoff against Atlanta, again, you look on paper, the kind of the players they had, Rico Cardi, Henry Aaron, and Orlando Cepeda, I mean, they had some Hall of Fame guys on that team. The Braves had hit 141 home runs as a team in 69, and if the upstart Mets were to have a shot, most observers agreed they'd have to hope their young arms could outpitch Atlanta's own formidable rotation. Most of the papers were talking about it was going to be a pitcher's duel. It turned out to be a hitter's duel. A duel the Mets would win in games one and two by scoring a combined 20 runs. And the series went back to New York with the Mets looking to sweep. I think everybody thought we'd be tense because we didn't have the experience. But from top to bottom, everybody was loose. But at Shea, early in game three, Henry Aaron got the Braves going early with one swing of the bat. Against Braves right-hander Pat Jarvis, though, the Mets' bats awoke again. There's a long drive. Oh, God, oh, Out of here. Long drive. Goodbye. Oh, As New York put up seven runs in a span of four innings, 22-year-old Nolan Ryan threw seven innings of three-hit relief, guiding the miracle Mets into the World Series. As the Mets were sweeping the Braves, the Orioles and Twins were doing battle in the inaugural ALCS. Having to go play Minnesota was kind of scary because they had a terrific team. Even though Baltimore had won 109 games, the Twins' bats scared the birds. We had a deep concern about winning those games against Minnesota because they were a tough ball club. Game one went to extra innings, and in the 12th with a 3-3 score and Mark Belanger on third, Paul Blair 
took the twins completely by surprise. Belanger's on third, he gets a 2-2 count, perfect slot for me to lay down the butt. Blair the batter, Blair lays down a perfect butt. Here comes Belanger to score the winning run. I was playing third base in that game and didn't expect it, so that's the kind of baseball they played in Baltimore. The next day, game two, again went into extra inning. This time a scoreless affair. Anytime you got a bunch of zeros up there, uh, there's, there's some pressure on you. And we didn't know exactly how we were going to win that game, but something would happen. And something happened in the bottom of the 11th when Baltimore's Kurt Moten came up with two on against twin star reliever Ron Paranowski. We knew that we had our backs up against the wall against Baltimore, so we knew that we were in trouble. Moten single to right scored Boob Pell, and the Orioles grabbed command of the series with their second straight extra innings win. We had a scramble to win those two ball games, and it certainly helped us going out in the third game to relax and let our bats come to life. Game three was not nearly as close, an 11-2 Orioles route in Minnesota. A scary situation after you win all those games during the course of the year and have to go three out of five because Minnesota did have a good ball club. But the Orioles had escaped. All that stood between them and a title were a few miracle workers from New York. I think you can just about sum up the 69 World Series as saying, if you pick it on paper, it's the Orioles. Yes, we thought we were going to win. We didn't think there was any doubt about it. Both the Mets and Orioles had won 100 games in the regular season, but New York was considered a huge underdog against powerhouse Baltimore. They have the best statistics in hitting, lowest staffer and run average. They've made the fewest errors. But the Mets didn't win the National League on paper. They won it on the field, and that's what they're hoping to do here today. Still, as the series got underway, the Orioles were confident, very confident. In my mind, I thought this was one of the greatest teams that was ever assembled. Which would have been hard to argue with, the way Mike Cuellar greeted the Mets in the first. A 2-2 delivery. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Orioles bats got started quickly against Tom Seaver. Buford led the game off against Tom Seaver with a home run. Buford leads off with a home run. Here we go, boys. You know, we got them. The O's added to their lead with three more runs in the fourth. All the support Mike Cuellar would need. Second baseman Johnson goes to first. And that's the ballgame. Baltimore has been victorious by a score of 4-1. to one. All was going according to plan for the Orioles. And then suddenly it wasn't. We ran into a buzzsaw. The buzzsaw's name was Jerry Kuzman, starting game two for the Mets against Dave McNally. You had to have one guy pitch a game that you had to win, I would say Jerry Kuzman. I remember I had a little incentive that I treated on my own that I wanted to pitch a perfect game in the World Series. Kuzman walked a batter in the second, but was holding the Orioles hitless when in the fourth, Don Clendenin gave the Mets the lead. What after the fastball? And every time we needed a big hit, he came through for it. Ben Denon has really been hitting in this series yesterday and today. Kuzman took his no-hitter into the seventh, dominating the Orioles, even as he clung to the 1-0 lead. Then outfielder Paul Blair finally got to him. Then Blair stole second. There goes the runner. And Brooks Robinson's bouncer found a hole. Robinson. It was suddenly a one-to-one -one ball game, and it stayed that way until the night when Ed Charles and Jerry Grody kick-started a two-out rally for the Mets. And the Mets have runners on first and third. Which brought up unheralded infielder Al Weiss with a chance to play hero. So the Mets returned home with the series tied, looking to seize the momentum. Leading off the first, Tommy Agee had an idea of how to do just that. Anytime you're in a big game and your leadoff hitter home runs and first at bat in the bottom of the first, it gives you a whip.
Well, he just had a tremendous World Series. He really did everything. There's a drive in the deep left center, racing hard as A.G. When you play that kind of aggressive approach to it and you succeed, what does it do to that other dugout? What can we do? And in the seventh inning, there were even more A.G. heroics. And it is a fly ball. It'll be tough to get to. A.G. is going, and A.G. Second one, I think I drifted a little bit, and then the wind took it away from me, and then I had to, at the end, run real hard. Now this ball is possibly saved by A.G. made two catches that the world still remembers. They are two of the great catches in World Series history. With A.G. leading the way at the plate and in the field, and Gary Gentry and Nolan Ryan combining on a four-hit shutout on the mound, the Mets took game three decisively. change and surprise across baseball and America. The Mets were suddenly in position to deliver perhaps the biggest shocker of all. Up two games to one in the 1969 World Series with New York in a fit of excitement. Mets 25 game winner Tom Seaver went to the mound in game four aiming to put the series further out of reach. Were the Orioles the favorite? Yes they were. Did they have great players? Yes they did. But you're coming back with the best pitcher in baseball back then. You're coming back with Tom Seaver. Seaver was brilliant from the start, silencing the Baltimore lineup. Like a slider and hit that corner. Earl Weaver's frustration soon boiled over, and in the sixth, he became the first manager thrown out of a series game since 1935. I thought the umpire missed a call. I should have been able to keep my temper just a little bit more. The Miracle Mets, meanwhile, continue to roll. He's out of here for a home run for Don Seaver and the Mets held a 1-0 lead for eight innings. Then in the top of the ninth, with a runner on third and one out, another amazing outfield play curbed an Oriole rally. And there's a drive to right center, Roboda. The game is tied. <laughs> How he ever made that play, I'll never know. When he took off of that ball in that critical situation, we thought he was going to play it safe or shouldn't play it safe. Instead, he dove for a ball. If he misses it, it goes by him. It turned out it was the greatest catch, and he's laying prone to the ground and completely stretched out. Hans Ramona making another sensational catch for the net. The game went to the 10th tie. And in the bottom of the frame, fate appeared to intervene once more, as J.C. Martin was hit by a Pete Rickard throw, allowing Rod Gaspar to dash home with the winning score. Here comes the winning run. The Mets win the ball game by a score of 2 to 1. Improbably, the Mets had a 3-1 series lead and a chance to clinch the World Series at Shea the next afternoon. All right, the Mets taking the field here. None of us wanted to go back to Baltimore. We wanted to win right there at Shea. Kuzman had pitched brilliantly in game two, but wasn't quite as sharp this time around. There's a long belt by Robinson. It's gone. Meanwhile, Dave McNally was mastering the Mets on the mound and doing further damage at the plate. And that ball is into the Baltimore bullpen. The Orioles took a 3-0 lead. Bring him on. But by now, it was clear the odds meant little to the Mets. Leon skipping to get out of the way, and it's ball one. In the sixth, the McNally pitch to Cleon Jones appeared to bounce away. But when Mets manager Gil Hodges presented a ball with a shoe polish stain on it to the umpires, Jones was awarded first base. The manager bringing the ball back out and showing it to the umpire, and the umpire says, yeah, okay, you go to first base. Another shoe polish play. Here it's Jason. The polish was the beginning of the end for the Orioles, as Clendenin followed with a homer. And after Kuzman settled down, Ron Swoboda gave the Mets a lead. They would never surrender. Jones is coming home. There'll be no play in the play. The Mets are leading by a score of four to three. From there, it was just a matter of time. 
There's two outs and a runner on, and I'm pitching to Davey Johnson. I'm so nervous, I really didn't know where the ball's going anymore. I mean, I'm, all I was trying to do was just throw strikes. There's a fly ball. The team that couldn't had become the team that did. Look at this scene. Never before and never since has there been a more unlikely world champion than the 1969 New York Mets. We come to play. This is a club that played this way all year long. We came from behind. We did it today because we never put our heads between our legs and we always fought. And it's the greatest feeling in the world. It was a tremendous feeling. That was a high that we never came down off of. After their surprising loss to the Mets in 1969, Earl Weaver's Orioles responded in 1970 with another dominant season, winning 108 games, and this time, the World Series over the Reds in five games. Baltimore would reach two more World Series while winning more games than any other AL franchise in the 1970s. The Mets, meanwhile, proved to be a one-year wonder reverting to mediocrity in 1970 with 83 wins. Three seasons later, though, they'd return to the World Series with many of the same players after winning only 82 games in a strange 1973 season. The New York Mets have won the pennant! The New York Mets have won the pennant! 1969 had been a groundbreaking year, enveloped by upheaval and uncertainty all across America. But to this day, it's also remembered for a ballpark miracle no one saw coming. Ladies and gentlemen, the 1969 world champion. The unexpected, unforgettable, and amazing New York Mets.